This conference will now be recorded. Oh no. Oh <laughs> now no. It's for yeah, now it's courtroom loop rules. So when you were saying we're thrilled to have this thing and almost be Not done with it, she's just like, no, nah, we're just we're thrilled to be almost done. No, I love the world where we're <laughs> That's very cool about it, so as much as I didn't have to take a look at it. But um, uh, welcome to everybody, to include the people that I can't necessarily see. Uh, this is, uh, as you can see, the thrilling conclusion uh, to a series that um, we, we've rerun here. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about the armistice tonight, but we're really also going to be talking about things like news are gone. Uh, we'll be going into that just a little bit. This presentation is built different than, uh, than the last time we gave it. Uh, it's also built different than any of the other presentations we give. Uh, it's a little bit shorter. I want to encourage uh, dialogue with this. And I know um, if you're sitting behind a computer, that might be a little bit uh, that might be a little bit uh, the thing that you might be shy on, but don't feel shy. Uh, so speak up. Uh, lots of information, and there it's all bullet points. This is one of the most classic army examples of PowerPoint that you probably will ever see, and I am deeply not at all sorry about that. So let's get going. Um, first thing here uh, is our fantastic timeline. I bet we would uh, to show everybody. Uh, no, you don't have to go through all this. No, there's not a test on this at the end. Uh, but the highlighted pieces of this are what we're primarily going to focus with. Uh, so. Uh, the three march treaty between the russians and the germans uh as well as the 28 may battle of cantini and of course views are gone there we'll get right into the armistice follow up with what's going on with uh, adf siberia and then get into some uh as i mentioned in rock island range earlier controversial history uh as we get into the 1920s so uh we start here with uh, seeing kind of the death throes of the war. And uh, that kind of starts with the Three March Treaty of Brest the Tops. Um, we talked about this in the last presentation, uh, but uh, I'll kind of abridge it here. The Russians have had a ridiculously insane civil war that's been happening uh, for about the last, really and truly, if you want to be technical, about the last 11 years. Um, during this time, uh, the Sardom has fallen. There is a recognized government that most of the world recognizes. All of the world pretty much, except the Russians themselves, recognize this government. Uh, and it results in a civil war that has about 30 to 40 different factions in it that are all in fight. What will eventually happen is the Red Bolsheviks are going to come out victorious in that. I use the term victorious loosely uh, because I don't, I'm of the opinion that nobody won anything in that civil war. Uh, and the net result is that the uh, Bolsheviks are actually running on an anti-war platform and they want to be in the out of war. They have no problems killing each other, but they have problems killing other people, uh, is the short version of this. Uh, so while the uh, treaty here is signed on 3 March 1918, uh, fighting between Russians and the Germans ends at the end of 1917. 21 March, uh, the Germans will launch their spring offensive, the Ludendorff Offensive, uh, against the British in Somme. Uh, by and large, it's an extremely nasty set of battles that will take place in Somme, uh, but the Germans are really kind of at a staggering point here. Uh, the focal point that the Germans want to get across, and correctly so, as we'll see towards the end of this presentation, is that they want to make sure that they are trying to knock out the British and the French as much as possible before the Americans can really get involved. Uh, so that's gonna be the bulk of the uh, German uh, mindset and, uh, and execution throughout the bulk of 1918. 26 March, uh, General Foch is actually uh, appointed as the Supreme Allied Commander. So now we have a unified commander that is overseeing all of the Allied operations that are happening in Europe. Uh, continued assaults in 1918. Uh, the second offensive near Ypres 
is uh, basically an attempt to drive uh, the British back across the English Channel. That, of course, does not go very well for the uh, for the Germans. And uh, by the time 25 May rolls in, uh, the American theater uh, will actually open in the Atlantic because the Germans are really just trying to keep the Americans back. And U-boats will actually finally start appearing uh, in the American waters in the Atlantic at that point. So uh, a really interesting piece, though, on this 25 May item here is that up to this point, uh, there had been very few, if any, U-boat sightings in American territorial waters in the Atlantic. Now, that being said, I want to make sure that I clarify this, it does not mean that American shipping was not under fire. It just means that U-boats are now uh, invading into American uh, managed waters at this point. They hadn't up to this point. Uh, but I also want to highlight that date because you will see that this war is actually relatively short. Uh, 25 May is when they have it. I think it's 25 October when the Germans finally cut it off. Uh, to continue this, uh, 27 May, there's one last effort to really split uh, the Entente forces and uh, trying to keep the Americans from reinforcing the British and the French. That's going to end in a failure. By the time we get to 28 May, the Americans are finally going to have their first major battle, the Battle of Cantini. Uh, it's going to be relatively decisive, relatively cut and dry uh, after uh, a decent amount of uh, a decent amount of fighting. Um, but the Americans will actually prove themselves enough uh, that they will be included by and large when it's time for news are gone. Uh, the last main push by the Germans any kind of offensive happens on 15 July. Uh, it is essentially the Hail Mary as they try to retake and cross the barn once again after having lost it. Uh, however, they're not quite able to do it. And after that 15 July mark, the Germans will not go on the offensive. 8 August, we get the 100 Days Offensive, um, and then immediately followed up by Muse Cardinal. These are gone is actually what we're going to, uh, to take a minute to talk about here uh, because it's a massive campaign. And some of you who remember our original World War I talks uh, remember that we actually did a presentation on these are gone uh, because it is the, it is kind of the cream of the crop when it comes to American participation in World War I. Americans were heavily involved in World War One after they stepped off, but Muse are gone was kind of the, the spear, if you will, that uh, the Americans uh, were really involved in. So the primary mission for Muse are gone, again, that's 26 September up through the armistice, uh, is to break through the Hindenburg position. Uh, while they do that, they're to attack German lines of communication and cut railways and supply material to the German army. Railway. Uh, logistics in World War I and even World War II are very, very critical. There's a very good reason for this. The major reason is that the gauge that is used on the rails between various nations is different. So if you have a situation where you are invading other European nations, chances are you are going to have to take time to re-gauge the rail in order to bring in material from the back to the front via rail. And rail was still the largest means of bringing uh, large quantities of this material in. So if you cut this, you have added an exorbitant amount of time needed for anybody to reuse that rail. Uh, and time was something that the Germans just did not have, even if they did retake the position. Uh, so cutting the railways was absolutely critical. Uh, and by and large, again, one other thing that I'll point out with the rails is that uh, most of the holdups that we see in World War One and Two come from uh, problems in logistics having to do with the transportation and movement of material from point A to point B. Sea Red Bull Express, World War Two. Uh, the means of motion for the attack is to attack northeastward between the Argonne Forest and the Meuse River towards Sedan. We'll take a look at that here in a second. 
and they were to attack in conjunction with uh, the French Fourth Army. Now, the rationale that was being used here, this is kind of a really crude way of bringing it up, but it's, it's one that I think is most effective, and it's how I personally have always seen it, is that even if First Army, First U.S. Army, is unable to take Sedan, uh, the distraction that is being provided by First Army will be enough that the flanks uh, of the British and French forces will be able to cross through, and that will be just enough. So the main focus of the attack will still succeed, even if First Army is unable to take Sedan. So, for those of you who remember, it's basically the Brusilov Offensive, but it's on the Western Front. So it, it's it's kind of brash, it's kind of nasty, it's kind of gritty, uh, but that is the rationale here. So for those, I don't have a little pointer, and uh, but I'm going to ask some people to switch. So Sudan is up in the very, it's right in B4 up there towards the top of that map. Uh, and the idea is that they are going to attack and cut across up towards uh, Sudan, attacking from... Uh, approximately, uh, oh, this is A2 down here. So they're going to try, try and cut north and then slightly east. So on 26 September, uh, there's going to be a three hour bombardment that stops at 0230. And it stops at 0530. So it's a three hour bombardment. Uh, the first corps is uh, going to attack via the Argonne, for or, uh, Argonne Forest. Then uh, the fifth corps. Uh, this is where uh, this is where you can tell that I'm not French. Uh, the fifth corps will attack west of Mont Falcon, and the third corps will attack to the east. Um, so th these are the three primary uh, forts that are going to be rushing in. A key thing to remember on these: these are individuals who are third divisions that haven't been in battle all that. These are relatively green and fresh divisions, so they're not necessarily battle seasoned. Um, they're getting their job done. Uh, so pretty much uh, coming right out of training or coming right out of simulated battles or coming out of smaller skirmishes, they haven't been part of a larger uh, campaign such as this. 27th September, uh, there will actually be uh, a liberation of uh, Montfaucon. And uh, unfortunately, however, that happens a day later than the American First Army wants to. They want it on the first day. Uh, so there's going to be a little bit of pushback there. By the next day, German reinforcements will arrive. Uh, the Fifth Corps will take their uh, objective on 29th September. And then on 30 September, there's a pause in the attack. It's relatively quick. Uh, you will have a pause in the attack in order to make sure that you replenish your forces, cycle out your divisions. Uh, take stock of the situation. The U.S. First Army is actually going to do this. They're going to cycle in more seasoned uh, military personnel. More seasoned soldiers are going to be coming in. So it's not going to be the, the fresh faces that were out there before. Uh, so after about 30 September, we start to see some of the more senior um, enlisted moving out and pushing in against the Germans. For October, the assault reduce. Uh, and then finally, by 7 October, Argonne Forest is actually entirely under uh, Allied control once again, all the way up to 8 October when uh, Allies will cross the Blues River. And then the operational objective of crossing the Hindenburg Line, which is one of the German defensive positions, will follow the next day. So this is just an absolutely massive offensive push by the Allies pushing back against uh, German occupied France at this point. 11 October, there's a second pause in the attack. Um, there is a replacement of General Cameron with General Summerall as the Fifth Corps commander at this point. So there's some high ranking changes as well. The key date, though, on this slide is 14 October. Uh, and that is when the German defenses finally break. And at this point, the only thing the Germans are going to be doing is retreat. 
if you wanted a date to draw in the line where World War One is for sure going to end and it's not going to be a German victory, this is your date. 14 October. Uh, 21 October, uh, Canal finally gets seized. Uh, so, Fifth Corps stays on the offensive uh, and breaking a third in May uh, German defensive line that ran through Canal. 1 November, there is uh, one last uh, First Army assault. And by 4 November, the Germans go into a full retreat, uh, abandoning pretty much most of the German occupied territories of France, at least up through Spain. 7 November, they do make it to the doorsteps of Stan finally. Uh, and then finally, there is a push to the east. And at that point, we have the armistice that comes in on the alarm, which ends the fighting in the Meuse Argonne offensive. They capture, allies will capture portions of Sedan. Uh, however, they do not capture all of Sedan. It's most likely that they would have probably by the end of this, but one of the key things that I want to point with Sedan here is Sedan would have been a decent strategic location and transportation hub for an intended 11 November offensive that was indeed planned prior to the armistice. And all the way up to the day, uh, to the hour, that the armistice went to effect, uh, it was intended that that offensive on 11 November was going to be carried out. That was the intent. Uh, however, when the fighting does indeed stop at 11 a.m. on 11 November, um, that offensive is shelved. But basically, they are just ready to go at any time from Sedan, via Sedan, into uh, the Rhine. So, uh, the writing is on the wall for the Germans as early as 15 October. And uh, this individual here, Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, German emperor and king of Prussia, the man that has an angry butterfly mustache. Um, so, by 15 October, the Atom powers now control most of that German occupied France. So, they have lost most of their territory by this time. By 21 October, as mentioned, Germany will end that unrestricted submarine warfare entirely across the entire Atlantic. Um, key thing about that, though, is that it is one of the points um, that originally brings the Americans into the war is this unrestricted submarine warfare. We've discussed that on some of talks before. One of them, it's not all of them. So for this to be removed is a very telling thing. 30 October, Turkey requests an armistice. Um, I'm not entirely sure why. Well, I know why we've got this much Turkey, but we'll, we'll go with it. 3 November, Austria Hungary concludes an armistice, signing with the uh, Anton Treaty State has fallen uh, at that point. And by 9 November, Kaiser Wilhelm abdicates the case goes into exile in the so he basically nails his piece of mouth uh, and uh, with his fantastic mustache and fleece to the Netherlands. So that brings us to the armistice, the armistice problem at this point. So as we, of course, all know, we all know the advantage the 11th month, the 11th day, the 11th hour. When I was little, I kept adding 11 to the summer until I could get the response to that I think of. And then I realized that's not how this works. Uh, the meeting for the armistice and the signing takes place in Field Marshal Poche's uh, uh, training park in the Forest de Campine in France. Uh, the signing actually takes place at 0500 in the morning. So outstandingly impressed was Gerald Poche with the German delegation that he just does not refuse. He refuses to shake their hand. I can't really say that I blame the man. Uh, after what uh, the Germans had done with France to that point. Uh, but it's signed and set so that the armistice goes into effect at 11 a.m., so after about six hours. That means that there's at least another six hours worth of fighting that is going to happen between 0500 and 11 in the morning. And indeed, 
there are plenty of casualties that take place on 11 November for that reason. Now, the time that the armistice does finally get signed and it goes into effect, the time that it goes into effect is largely considered to be the end of World War I. You were here last time, however, you know that is not true. Uh, there are a few dates that you could use as the end of World War I. Uh, one of them is indeed November 1918. Another date that you could use would be in April of 1919. Another date, even more so, could be 1 July 1920. And even more so, it could be January of 1923 when the last occupation forces came. So there's a few dates you can use. Or you can be like me and say that it wasn't World War I and World War II, it was just the World War II. That never really ended it. But we'll get to that. Uh, originally, as I mentioned, there was an Allied offensive plan to kick off on 11 November 1918. Uh, that was abandoned, loosely speaking, uh, once the armistice is signed. Uh, but the fighting does continue right up until the time that the armistice is effective. So there were 3,500 American casualties between 0500 and 11 uh, on the morning of uh, 11 November. Total Allied casualties for the day, over 10,000, almost 11. Uh, 2,738 of those were deaths. Uh, and the bulk of the effort, the main intent for the fighting to continue the day of the armistice is to make sure that we're keeping the Germans honest. Because uh, Foch and Pershing both are convinced the Germans are going to find a way out of this. The Germans are going to figure out a way out of this, and we are going to have a problem if we don't just eliminate the issue. Uh, so both of them are ready to move into Germany. And indeed, the intent is to drive to Germany and capture Berlin. That is the intent. Um, but ultimately, the Germans are going to withdraw. There will be a ceasefire. Um, and we will eventually get, unfortunately, our last casualties and losses of the war here. Uh, the Americans, of course, we can't be beat. Um, the last casualty to happen for the Entente happens at 10.59 a.m. And it's one of our very own there from charging a German machine gun position at 10.59 a.m. Uh, and he died at, as I said, at 10.59. Whether or not uh, he actually was charging that position, you know, the Germans got trigger happy about something or other. It's a matter of dispute. But the official reports say that he charged a, uh, a position and the German soldiers tried to wave him off with fire in self defense. Britain here. Last person to go at 0930 on that morning. Perhaps the most tragic individual, in my opinion. He enlists in 1912. He serves all throughout the war. He's been in the front line, he's been on patrol. And uh, the last day of the war, uh, while he's on patrol in Belgium, he gets killed while he's on patrol. And then of course, the French individual over here, last one goes down at 1045. The French will actually retroactively change his date of uh, passing to 10 November because they don't want anybody to know that there was a fight that took place on Armistice Signing Day, which I'm not entirely sure how you can have an occupied country where you have your own civilians and citizens and have them just magically not know that there was not fighting that took place when it was literally within eyesight. But I don't know. Maybe they might be. A little flash thing. Celebrations around the world. Absolutely fantastic, right? So uh, we have a few here. Uh, one of these, if I remember right, there's there's one that's in Belgium. There's one, a couple that are in London. Uh, one is San Francisco, and one of them is in New York. I'm pretty sure I know which one is New York. Um, however, there's something that's a little bit interesting about this, and I always thought that there was. So everybody around the world, pretty much at this point, German and Entente powers alike, were extremely glad that this war was over, because everybody was being left right at this point. But one thing that is particularly interesting is you have all these photos coming out of uh, celebrations, even soldiers returning home, soldiers celebrating. But the war's not over. 
we still have forces deployed in a combat space. In fact, we still have soldiers that are going to die and be counted among World War I dead. And that comes with Siberia. And in large part, what we actually will eventually pull our forces back out of Siberia is largely due to the fact that public opinion has gone back to the war is over. Why is my buddy or my family member dead now? And the justification just really isn't there. Uh, we're up in the North Pole Santa land looking for material that might be there. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't sound good. Um, so by and large, uh, we'll begin to pull those forces home by uh, the end of 1919 and we'll be totally out there by the uh, summer of 1919. So World War One by the numbers. These are always the most impactful slides. Uh, so Germany and Russia putting up the bulk of the uh, manpower up there. But one thing that I want to point out here is the United States comes out with 4.3 million soldiers. Of those 4.3 million soldiers, they have a 3% killed in action rate and a 6% wounded in action rate. That is juxtaposed to France with their 8.4 million contribution, 16% casualty rate, or uh, killed in action rate, 51% wounded in action rate. So you had a greater than 50-50 chance of being in chief France army and getting wound up, shot at, or taking the bullet, or in some other shape, way, or form being injured in some way uh, associated with World War One. Russia, not too much better when you really think about the numbers. 12 million troops deployed, 4.95 million wounded, 1.7 million killed in action. Uh, the total uh, cost of the war in uh, 1918 dollars was $186.3 billion. Of the 65 million troops deployed for 8.5 million deaths, 21.2 million. Uh, so impactful numbers here. Uh, another number that I thought was exceptionally interesting. Um, ah, yes, our good friends to the great north also contributed. Um, so we had 619,000 uh, contributions from uh, uh, Canada. And 11% KIA and 28% uh, will do the national. Also, I want to point out on this list, there's more. There are more countries involved in this. These are just the major belligerents, as we call them. Uh, so there are probably some additional figures that you might see down here are associated with some of them. Uh, Turkey would be one, Italy would be one. Um, there, there would be others, but this, this is just a general cursory idea. So what were the conditions of the terms of surrender? This is, this is where things start to get a little funky. So there were 34 total terms and conditions for the surrender. Uh, chief among them, the surrender of materiel. Uh, so guns, guns and aircraft. I find it interesting that we didn't ask them or demand them surrender their U-boats, uh, but we indeed did not. Germans were also to return to their borders as they were in 1914, and all German forces and assets in Africa and other locations, all colonial assets were to be seized or dropped. Uh, so this is the effective end of colonial Germany as we know it. Uh, and that is going to be a major thing when we deal with additional war uh, breaking out in some of these uh, regions, especially in Africa, uh, throughout the 1960s, 70s, 80s, all the way up to the present, as we still see this fallout from colonial access. Eventually, we get to the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, one of the great things about this treaty is it was a treaty where we didn't invite the other party that was supposed to sign the treaty. Uh, so none of the central powers. Germany was not. Uh, Austria-Hungary was not. Uh, none of them were. 
uh, but Germany was still nonetheless forced to, and I quote, assume all blame and cause for the war, a $31.4 billion, 1918 dollars, and reparations, which is about 40, $442 billion in 2008, and give up all of its colonial assets. Officially signed on 28 June 1919, and that is a contractual However, stipulations in the Treaty of Versailles was to also establish a League of Nations to oversee oversight many things uh, that have to do with mutual aid, mutual pact, mutual security. And this was a great idea of one President Woodrow Wilson within his 14 points, despite the fact that it came from a U.S. president. And the U.S. president was still presiding at the time. Congress, U.S. Congress, did not appreciate the fact that they had to give up rights to any type of military uh, control or organization to a foreign entity. So the net result is it gets created without its keystone member, the United States. Uh, and many will actually say this is one of the reasons that World War II will eventually break out. I'm not one of those historians. I don't believe that's where it actually started. I think most of it actually starts in these pieces up here. Um, however, there's a little bit more to it. Uh, but that's primarily where the, uh, where the interest of the focus is. Huh. We have this thing about um, learning from your past to understand mistakes of the day. So these are the redrawn boundaries of the world here. So you have Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland emerging as independent states here. I do want to highlight here, though, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and even, uh, yeah, I would go with these. Those, not at all really related to the, what happened. Uh, most of these have more to do with what was happening in Russia. Um, because, if anybody remembers, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and even Poland, those were all separatist movements in the Russian uh, Revolution. Uh, so most of these are going to break out. They're going to come through uh, the Treaty of Versailles, uh, but most of these are breaking out uh, due to uh, signings there. But what's more interesting is this other map showing how the Middle East gets divvied up, at least through Iraq, uh, Syria, Jordan, uh, into uh, Israel, modern day Palestine, uh, and then over up towards Turkey, uh, and of course, northern Saudi Arabia there. These are all just lines that were drawn, uh, arbitrary lines that were drawn. Uh, by the British and the French. Uh, there's a couple more that aren't actually shown here, uh, specifically in Afghanistan and Iran, that uh, get drawn by the British. And ultimately, uh, these lines are what are, is just extremely haunting everybody that has anything to do with the Middle East, including the Middle East itself. Uh, so a lot of uh, a lot of these problems and issues uh, come out of what begins here will manifest itself again after World War II. So, uh, foreshadowing. Uh, Foch was good at that. I didn't know that he said this until I started working in the Army. Uh, Foch's remarks on the Treaty of Versailles are correctly, it's an armistice for 20 years. That's in you know, July of 1919. We all know what happens on what's September of 1939. Uh, and of course, no presentation would be complete without our fantastic uh, comic doodle. So we have Belgium, France, England, and Italy all break, building this bridge of peace, uh, but they're missing the keystone member, which is the United States, and that's supposed to be the fiction of the League of Nations there. So, uh, and Pershing was also. Uh, a fair critic of how uh, the Treaty of Versailles was handled, how that whole situation kind of pushed out. So really, the military commanders on the ground had a better idea of what was going on with the politicians that were driving it. So 
But we have an occupation now. Uh, there's there's an occupation need for occupation as uh, outlined in condition five of the armistice. The areas of the left bank of the Rhine shall be administered by local authorities under the control of the occupation troops of the allies in the United States armies of occupation. The army of occupation that is stood up on 14 November 1918 is third army uh, and it will largely have its structure composed of active army, army units, National Guard, Army Reserves. Uh, interestingly enough about these uh, latter two is that the majority of these now are handled by the first army. Um, but uh, third army is going to be established as the primary occupation forces uh, that are active in, in the, uh, the Rhineland, uh, basically in all portions of, um, of West Germany. So, fortunately, though, by and large, a lot of these, um, a lot of these troops are like going from combat to a state of just being an occupation. Uh, so it's very hard to come down off of that adrenaline because uh, one minute you're being told, "Well, you have orders to kill this guy," and now it's just like, "All right, we'll just make sure that he's not breaking the law." It's a real big change in your in your demeanor. Uh, there were less than two weeks for the Americans to actually prepare for that march that takes them into the Rhineland. And most of those divisions, like I said, were coming straight out of combat. But another fantastic thing is most of them had lice uh, from the conditions in the trenches. And many of them were suffering from the 1918 1919 H1N1 flu, um, which I don't know anything that we could draw a parallel between. Um, but another thing about this, too, is that their material has been worn out by and large at this point, including their transportation. So this is World War I. We're still, it's still very realistic and understandable to have cavalry and horse-drawn carriages, animal power. These animals are just done <laughs> with, with this whole thing. Uh, and, Frankly, rightfully so. Uh, I, as an animal advocate, I can definitely understand that. Um, but the horses and uh, are just tired at this point too, just like the just like the soldiers are. So we've got to also take care of another few things with the soldiers. We've got to figure out how to get them well, how to get them de uh, Eventually, uh, lice infestation drops to one percent. So they we'll use steam sanitization methods for that. Uh, as for disease, though, and food and everything else, Germany had been occupied, or um, not occupied, but blockaded for all four years to war. Uh, so they don't have much in the way of food, uh, medicine, uh, and really any general supplies. So there's not a lot going on in Germany right now for the Americans or the occupying forces to use. Uh, so there's a huge logistical mission to bring all this stuff in. Eventually, the army is actually going to take over laundromats and they're going to take over some horses and soldiers. Um, and this is mainly because of a lack of workforce and a lack of ability to actually uh, safely staff and maintain those institutions. Uh, so the army is going to come in and staff them until they can actually train up uh, civilians to fill up the wars. Eventually, though, we have something that's so the United States was largely uh, an isolationist nation. Uh, it was it, it was not ready at the public level to become a global power of any sort. Uh, the public was not ready for that. Uh, so what happens here is we get the start of the roaring 20s. There's a post-war economic boom. And what happens when things are good? Start looking just inward, your field of vision narrows a lot more when things are good, when things are happy, you don't tend to look out quite as much. And that's exactly what begins to happen in the US. There's less interest in keeping an occupying army in Germany, there's less focus on what's going on in the Rhineland. Uh, what eventually will happen is those American forces will be brought home in the January of 1923. 
all the remaining material that's over there will either be sold or auctioned. Uh, so pretty much they're going to up anchor and just head on out. That creates a few problems. Uh, and that is where we have this brand new fantastic slide. So what's the world like? So in America, it might be all right. It's going to be all right for about six more years uh, before things really. So the occupation army withdraws from Germany in 1923, January. The Japanese are still in Siberia at this time. And they'll only begin to start to draw down. They'll finally uh, conclude that in 1923. They're still going to be on the main, uh, which should have been alarming to anybody who was paying attention that the Japanese were still here. But at the same time as all this happens, hyperinflation is going to just rock Germany and other portions of Europe as well. So much so, this is a fantastic picture right here. This is a German 10 billion mark note that is being used as a scratch paper. There are photos of walls being insulated and then wallpapered with 10,000 market notes, all just stacked up. Um, it was not uncommon to see a one trillion market note. Uh, and actually, I took a look at it at one point, and one trillion marks equaled about 10 US dollars. So it, it got pretty bad uh, as far as the hyperinflation goes. But in addition to that, Scars of War. This is an aerial photo of what the trenches look like in France. Now, if you can imagine uh, what the trenches look like right there, you can also imagine that all those little white dots that you see on there are artillery shells, where artillery shells have been impacted. Uh, not to mention the chemical warfare that's also taking place at the time. So you have large swaths of land that was once agricultural that is now unused. So now you also have an economic crisis that is worsened uh, by a reduction of food and an agricultural crisis that's coming in on top of that. You have economical issues, you have agricultural issues, supply and demand is extremely in flux, uh, as well as political ramifications from all of this. In short, if you are in Europe, chances are you're pretty pissed off. Uh, at the same time, Stalin is going to come into power, and in, that's going to begin in 1924 after Lenin's death. And unfortunately, through all this, we keep a narrow focus in life. And we don't see that Germany and the Weimar Republic is starting to do things that are a little bit interesting, a little bit crazy sounding. Uh, we don't listen to the rhetoric. Uh, and eventually, uh, the two points that we should have been paying attention to, which was Japan and Germany, would be the focal points. As Japan will kick off uh, their invasion of Manchuria in 1931. Germany, of course, will march into Warsaw in 1939. And the world was indeed between two fires. As uh, C.D. Lewis says, more than with new move then with new desires for where we used to build and love is no man. And only ghosts can live between that is exactly where we unfortunately leave off in this full sun. Uh, with that, folks, here and elsewhere, uh, I open it to questions and comments. I don't have any questions online. Say if they want to unmute themselves. Yeah. Yeah. If, if anybody does want to uh, unmute yourself and uh, and ask a question, feel free to do so. And I can stop the recording. Hello. That's that's a scary. Not too big. 